So, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this event, uh, which will have the topic of Singapore as a market. Uh, and this is an event that is co organized between Visit Sweden, uh, Clusters of Sweden, and Mobile Heights. Uh, my name is Ola Svedin, and I'm the CEO of Mobile Heights, and I'm also the chairman of the board for Clusters of Sweden. Uh, so uh, I will uh, leave to my colleague, Carolina Garces, to explain a little bit of what the agenda looks like today. Yeah. So welcome. Thank you, Ola, and welcome, everyone. It's so nice to have you here today. My name is Carolina Garces. I am responsible for internationalization of Mobile Heights. A little bit about the house rules. Uh, this is a hybrid event. Uh, so everybody that is online, please uh, mute your uh, microphone so we can hear the presentation and use the chat um, to put your questions. We will help you to present them um, here. And welcome everybody who is here today as well. Um, we will have uh, a presentation from Ricard until 9.30, and then we will open for questions for 10 minutes until 9.40. 9.40, we will have three tech companies from Singapore that we have met, Mobile Heights have met them already uh, in Singapore. We think that they have pretty nice technologies. Uh, they will have three minutes to pitch, and after each pitch, uh, you can present your questions for three more minutes. So one, two questions per company. Yeah, now I want to welcome Ricard Levine, a country manager for Singapore at Business Sweden. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, really good to be back in, in Lund, uh, the city I spent uh, five years studying economics and law some, some 15 years ago. Uh, been back back and forth and, and I, I met Ola and Carolina in, in Singapore in, in late last year. Um, invited to this event. Uh, I will for the next 30 minutes, uh, uh, this is me, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the region as such in South and Southeast Asia and, and why we at Business Sweden believes it's important to pay attention to it now in 10 years, but primarily towards 50, 2050. There's a lot of changes going on in, in the region that we need to start thinking about hard now. And in that puzzle, Singapore will play a very important uh, piece. The second half of the presentation, we will zoom in on Singapore as such as a market, look a little bit at the history, and then do a little bit of reactions to the future in terms of business opportunities and so on. Feel free to shoot questions, uh, but leave the more discussion-oriented questions afterwards to the presentation, if, if possible. Just one minute about Business Sweden. Um, our mission is to help Swedish company sell and grow uh, their international sales and to drive investments to Sweden. So we, we work uh, both ways. Uh, we are present at 38 markets. We have about uh, 46 uh, offices around the world and we're about 500 in place. 400 of them you can see are located abroad. Um, we are jointly owned by the Swedish government and the Swedish business com community. And, and as such, we are quite a unique feature in this sort of business promotion agency uh, landscape out there looking at other countries as well, right? We have three, you can sort of business lines. We do more proper uh, consulting work. Uh, we do in incubation and establishment work, and we do the governmental assignments. And at the end of the presentation, I will come back to one of these governmental initiatives that we are doing later this year in Singapore, the larger event. So, starting a little bit, zooming out, and hopefully looking forward. Talk a little bit about the topics of GDP and demographics. First, the region as such. Um, this goes without saying, very strategic position of Singapore. Uh, down here, coming back to that in just a few minutes. Um, yeah, you can leave that map aside. Start to looking at Swedish export from Sweden. Uh, <laughs> export from Sweden. Uh, what we've seen, and this is not true only for Sweden, we are doing slightly worse than our Nordic uh, peers, but our export primarily goes to countries in our absolute geographic neighborhood. 
And we also tend to export the most to Sweden. The countries have similar economic conditions. And when we talk about economic condition, we have uh, marked that as GDP per capita. Um, the size of the economy as such doesn't appear to play that much of a role, but worth paying attention to here that in the coming years, and we're coming back to this just a few minutes, countries such as India, Indonesia, and so on will raise both in terms of their GDP per capita and the total GDP. What will that mean for Swedish export? We do not really know, but it's worth paying attention to, right? We did a bit of a study where we looked at how far from Sweden do we actually export? And we took Örebro as a, as a center point for that. And uh, about 54% of our export is in a range of 100 uh, my, uh, thousand uh, kilometers from Örebro. Uh, of course, we have substantial great export to both US and, and, and China, but only 7% taking China and, and the US away uh, are exported for further than 2,000 kilometers from Örebro. So, of course, we are moving forward uh, from the days of the Vikings, uh, but we believe there's a lot more to do here. Why? Uh, many people are in the business of doing pre projections of the future. Uh, when we asked the World Bank, or we looked at the World Bank figures here in January, in terms of where will growth come from in terms of GDP in 2023, the, the, the figures for 2024 almost the same. And uh, uh, what, what, what we can say is that the majority of the growth in the world will come from, re, uh, from countries in the South and the Southeast Asia. Um, India uh, leading the pack, but also countries like Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, and so on are up there. China, I think they did a reverse calculation, so that their figure looks more like close to 6% now, uh, but it's, it's of course uh, coming back after COVID. Um, so that's also worth paying attention to right now. But in the more gloomier part of the world, United States and Euro area uh, down here, growth doesn't appear to come, come this year. Reverting back to where we have our export, I think that's important to pay attention to. Looking really for, look, uh, long into the future, 2050. And we believe that, that it's important to pay attention to that date because uh, it appears that it's long into the future, uh, but many of us remember actually what we had for supper at uh, the millennial. And that's about as far into the future we are looking at 2050. The time is moving fast and soon we are there. And if we believe the OECD estimates, the Indian economy will, or the Chinese economy, will surpass the US economy to be the largest economy by about in the early 2030s. And in the early 2040s, the Indian economy is projected to surpass the US economy as second largest economy. That will, of course, have huge implications all over the world in terms of trade, and so on, politics, not to talk the least. But what even more important we believe is to pay attention to is the doubling effect or how many times bigger the Indian economy will grow towards 2050 compared to today. And looking at these estimates, it's about 12 times bigger in just about 30 years, right? Uh, will this figure hold true? Of course not. But give it give us as 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 an indication. Yes, I think it can work as a quite good uh, implication of the future. We also see that that GDP per capita is growing, not as impressive in 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 India as you might expect, and that's of course something that you should pay attention to, as we know from from the figures that we have saw that Sweden primary export to countries where we have similar. Uh, economic condition, what we call GDP per capita, right? But still, India will be a major force uh, in the future. And I think uh, already this year, we have four Swedish ministers traveling uh, to India. That's by far the most visited country by a Swedish minister this year. Worth paying attention to India. Yes, a little bit of a sidetrack here, what we believe is important also to state when we talk about the future of of economic growth is that when you put 
literacy rate, the rate of, of how many people can, can read in the, in, in the population in relation to GDP per capita, it appears impossible to have economic growth without educating your, uh, your population for reading. So it's very important that all boys and girls are educated in, in reading. And we are actually doing right now a deep dive study on demographics and GDP uh, development. And one thing to pay attention to in India is this fact. That this is also a fact in Africa that we will see. Will they manage to educate the young population? India, as you know, is a country of various states and so on. Some are more developed than others. And, and there are also a problem with who gets that education. Uh, the same relationship goes with, uh, with peace. Uh, it's impossible to have economic development if you're affected by conflict, not being engaging in conflict. We know uh, Russia, of course, right now, but also other countries have been participating in conflict, but not affected by it. So very important to have, to, to, to have peace in your country if you want to have economic, uh, economic growth. We're coming back to that in just a few minutes, why it has played an important role for uh, the growth of Singapore over the years. Uh, as we all know, perhaps is that, that, that more and more people are living in Earth. Uh, by 2050, it's believed to be about 9.7 billion people uh, living on Earth. Most of these people will live in Africa and in Asia. Um, we also see, of course, a, a on a global level, more and more older people. And double click on the, the Asian uh, continent. Uh, we have divided it here in, 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 in three regions, where in South Asia, uh, where India is, of course, the predominant power, there would be an increase of about 300 million people that is in working age. And when we talk working age, it's between 15 and 64, right? But that can be, of course, debated, is it 22? But yeah, that's what, that's what we talk about. The same number in East Asia, of course, China and also Japan are driving the numbers there, will have a decrease of about 300 million people, if you ask uh, UM. Um, what will this mean? Uh, this will mean many things. First of all, another 300 million people in working age uh, is, of course, a huge impact in terms of people that can work, pay tax, and so on and so on. Uh, the same goes for uh, down here. What will this mean? Uh, 300 million people less that work, pay tax, and so on. Of course, great implications. Uh, almost for the economy, right? A sidetrack to that is the uh, thing of urbanization. Uh, it's believed also talking to, to the UN that about 2.2 billion people will, 2.2 more billion people will live in cities uh, by 2050 compared to 2020. The majority of them, th th this shift will happen in Africa and in South and Southeast Asia. This will have huge implications of, on, on the states where these cities are located in terms of building uh, resilience for infrastructure, for healthcare, waste and water treatment, energy, and so on. And in the region in Southeast Asia, where Singapore is leading the way, many countries are looking at Singapore as an outpost for the region as, and as something that you can bench yourself in the region. So re Singapore is really sort of a, an example of a good way of building resilient cities in Asia, where many people are paying attention. And we believe that for Swedish companies, this is something to also pay attention to in all fields, because this will affect basically all fields, right? This huge migration of, of people into cities. Pensions. Yes, very short before we, we're moving on here. Uh, more and more people are moving into retired age. Um, 
and uh, they're gonna be a boom here in in East Asia in the coming in the coming uh, eight years about, uh, where additional 81% are turning 65 in China. What sort of pressure would that put on the on the system there? Great pressure on the systems, right? Of course, politicians can say that as Macron with some success or not success are trying to implement in France here, that we get less works until the 70s. But that only solved the short term problem. The long term problem is, of course, that states need to think serious about having people uh, be both physically and mentally fit to work and produce longer into the future. Very important uh, fact to pay attention to if you're in the business of life science at any course, right? Because this will be the main driver for many states. How can we keep our population working and paying tax the longer, right? Because I don't think anyone in this room, but if you talk society at large, people might think that uh, um, uh, retirement uh, pay, pensions, that they are saved in some sort of box somewhere, and then you pick it up when you grow old. Unfortunately, that's not the truth, right? It's just part of the system and someone needs to pay for the pensions and our pensions is not paid yet. So that would be a huge pressure to society as well moving forward. Uh, yes, before we shifting gears here to, 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 to more focusing on Singapore, um, we looked at a few correlation studies and this should be taken with a bit of, of, of salt perhaps, but I, I, we think it gives a good indication. For example, in energy demand, it tends to, to, to correlate with increased GDP per capita. So of course, throughout Southeast Asia, the demand for energy will increase heavily. So how to solve that? Of course, we can produce more energy, but we also need to be, or they need to focus a lot more about being uh, efficient in the usage of energy. And that's one of the fields in Singapore, which is just coming back to, that they pay a lot of attention to. How can we be more energy efficient in our life? Okay, shifting gears to, to Singapore as such. I talked in the beginning there on the, on the strategic position of, of Singapore. And one way to look at that is to look at, I think it's called Marine Tracker, this, this app. And what you see here, that's ships coming. And this is Singapore. And so everyone is passing by that, right? So I would be certain if Singapore such would be placed there, they wouldn't have the success as they had as we put there, right? And this, yeah. And we know Singapore has made a, a, a unprecedented growth journey since its birth in 1965. Um, this is how it looks in 1965. This is how it looks today. Unprecedented, never heard of before. Why is this? Let's go back a few years before, or 100 years before 1965, where the Suez Canal was, was opened and the East Indian Company started to ship tea back and forth to China, right? And all of a sudden, going back to the map here, instead of going here, which was the natural route where you come below the Horn of Africa, going up here, you started to go here. And this was paid attention to by the East Africa, uh, uh, the British. And there was a man called Raffle. If you've ever been to Singapore, you perhaps heard of Raffles, Raffles Hotel. Raffles is a, a, a servant at the East Indian Company who were ta tasked to, to set up a harbor in, 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 in Singapore. And the, the British also colonialized uh, um, uh, Singapore. And that went on to about uh, when the Second World War started, when the, uh, the Japanese invaded. The Japanese were thrown out in in forty five, and um, after that, Singapore were, was a lost part of the world, a, pl a place of uh, rubbish, right? So, but building up Singapore was not on the top of the agenda for the British. They needed to build up London and so on. So Singapore became a bit of a pirate city, lawless city, full of opium and 
prostitutes and and all sorts of stuff, right? Uh, and this man, Li Kuo uh, Li Kuo came into uh, into power. You can say uh, he had a dream. His solution to the problems of Singapore was to merge with Malaysia. That was his sort of solution to, to, to solve it. Back to what we talked about before, stability, peace, and so on. He figured that out. We need to have peace and stability to build a nation. And to do that, we got to merge with Malaysia. And he succeeded. Uh, and they formed the Federation of Malaya. Uh, unfortunately for Singapore, or uh, unfortunately at the time they thought, was that only after two years, there was a shift in government in Malaysia and they decided to throw Singapore out. So they were back on the street. And uh, Mr. Lee here, who was educated as a lawyer in, in, in England, he started to say that we're really starting from a bad position here. What are we gonna do to, to build up Singapore? We have no nat nat natural resources, but we have the location and we have our people. So the first thing he, di he did was of implementing the, the home buying system with forced savings. Today, about 80% of all Singaporean own their own houses. So you can take that in the Swedish context would be that instead of that, we're having the million projected, the million projected project, all these apartments that we have throughout the, the, the country, which to some extent is related to the social issues today, as we can be open about, right? They would be owned. They are owned in Singapore. It's like the boosters as Ferenings, uh, system almost right and that together with forced savings uh, he also uh, put taxes low uh, and had a, a very high focus on on ease of doing business um, copied british law uh, they have the highest paid uh, the, the, the pay for working in government is the highest in the world in singapore uh, if, if if you score a job in in, in the government in singapore you've made it in life, right? And that's, of course, uh, drive talent to, to governmental jobs, right? And they had a strong focus on, on, on education. This is sort of the foundation uh, when Lee started off Singapore in 1965. Then this man, Mao, came with his um, cultural revolutions in the 70s. That meant that Singapore were and they will do that somewhere here. We're coming back to that again. But they took a lot of, of power and trade from Hong Kong and, and China in the 70s. Then everyone wanted a, a, a home computer and Singapore became the leading uh, uh, producer of hard disk drives. Then they started to focus on oil, uh, uh, refineries and uh, still today there are actually surprisingly a lot of the economy that comes from oil refineries. If you ever go to Singapore and look out there, you see a lot of these oil refineries out there. Then of course in the early 2000s they start to focus on the banking sector and today it's I would say top two, top three leading um, powers in terms of, of, of financing and, and, and banking in the region. And again, after what's happening, it started with the uh, can you say situations in, in Hong Kong in terms of, of uh, uh, demographic, um, uh, democratic movements uh, and later with the, the COVID, of course. And, and again, a lot of attention paid for what was moved from China to Singapore, right? A lot of banks and tech moved there. So, snapshot of the island, uh, second largest GDP in the world. Go back here and see, short. Here, only surpassed by, by, by Luxembourg. Uh, they have about $100,000 uh, in, in GDP per capita, Singapore. Sweden is about uh, 50, 55. So very impressive. Size of Singapore is about half the size of Ireland. Uh, political stability, as we'll be coming back to, they have, have had three prime, minister, prime ministers for about 60 years. 
and the father of the Singapore, his son is the current uh, prime minister. So they have a lot of, of, of stability. Are there true democracy? Yeah, it can be debatable, uh, but 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 it's a very very strong uh, stability in the in the political system. In terms of what is invested and who is investing in Singapore, a lot of investments. And when we talk about investments here. We talk FDIs, and here we have looked at number of projects is in the ICT and electronic sectors. Uh, then we have financial services, as we discussed, transport equipment, life science, environmental technologies, and so on. US is a uh, the largest player in terms of, of investing in Singapore. And we have seen a trend that they have in recent years due to the relationship with China increased their investments in, uh, in Singapore. Also, United uh, UK, France, Japan, and so on are, are very high invested in, in, in Singapore. Uh, Singapore is rated one of the most innovative countries in the world. There the, are the various kinds of these kinds of ratings. I think we looked at the, the WIPO ratings here. That's then we're looking at uh, patents, I believe. Uh, Sweden had topped that list for, 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 for many, many years. Uh, Singapore has going up, going up, going up, going up. And, and today, again, we are two of the most innovative countries in the world. And we believe this is an important fact when we look at collaborations with Singapore. It's a little bit the same child plays a long better sort of uh, structure to that thinking, right? Also, again, Singapore is located in the region that we discussed where a lot of startups is coming more and more uh, in countries like Vietnam, Malaysia have significant impact of, of or in significant increase of number of, of, of startups. So it's a great scene for startups, we believe. Um, back to, to Lee's thinking here about 60 years ago, Singapore has focused a lot on, on education uh, and has some of the top universities in the world. Uh, you in Lund here, I believe, have a great um, uh, collaboration with NUS. Um, I think uh, and Lund is one of the, the universities that sends most students to, to NUS around, uh, around the world. Uh, but looking at, at the talent pool in, in, in Singapore as such, they are number one in terms of, of English proficiency in the whole of Asia. Um, um, they are one of the most uh, attractive destinations uh, for, for, for talent and so on. With this said, uh, when we are out talking to the Swedish companies and when we talk to our peers in other countries, they say that finding talent in Singapore is becoming increasingly difficult. And we are not only talking about what we normally think about talent, these 20 somethings with a good degrees of good analytics and so on. We are talking across the spectra of talent from leadership, uh, but also to, to, to more uh, blue collar jobs. Very uh, hard to find to find talent in, in Singapore and the cost is increasing a lot for, 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 for keeping the person up. Uh, Political stability, there are again many indexes for that, but, but uh, Singapore are rated as one of the most stable political countries in the world, um, perhaps the most stable country around the world. Again, it's important to mention there that, that Singapore is a democracy, but it's not a free country in the sense that it's in Sweden. They have very strict laws for basically everything. And if you've been to the airport in Singapore, you believe, do I want to enter here or can I spit on the street and that kind of, of, of stuff, right? That's, that's not 100% true, but it's not that far from reality, put it like that, right? Uh, again, ease of doing business uh, uh, scoring. To be fair, the ease of doing business score, I think they put it down two years ago due to, to corruption from some countries down the list. But with that said, uh, I think you can you can be certain in saying that doing business in Singapore is is uh, easier than, than than in many other places in the world of setting up a bank account, the rule of law, 
uh, in terms of if, if you're in dispute and so on, can be solved in Singapore in a way that, that can't happen in other countries in the region. And that's actually time's up there, right? Yeah. Do I have one more minute to talk about Swedish companies? Yeah. Uh, so what we've seen here, uh, I mean, over, over many years, but really after the COVID, is the enormous increase of, of Swedish companies and personnel to, to Singapore. Today, there are about 300 Swedish companies established. Um, we have about 2,500 to 3,000 Swedish people living in, in Singapore. There's a Swedish school in Singapore, a Swedish church in Singapore, and so on. Again, back to the uh, to the students. We have, we have one of the big, largest per capita countries sending, sending students back and forth to, to Singapore. All the major companies are there uh, in Singapore. And uh, back to what I, what I just said, we have seen an increase of headquarters, APAC headquarters for these companies to Singapore over the last two years, moving from Shanghai and Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very inspiring presentation. Uh, yeah, we open the floor for questions now. Any questions? Maybe do we have questions in the chat? Yes. 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 My name is Rosa Hunqvist, um, and I um, I run a, a company uh, on um, trying to uh, combine uh, life science clusters across the world. Yep. And we are looking also into uh, Singapore. Yep. When we have been talking to that, like in Biopolis and another uh, kind of um, organization, yep. we figure out that they are very unfamiliar with the concept of a triple, quadruple, or pentahelix. They yeah. do not collaborate across um, government, uh, academia, yeah. and businesses. Is that? We are trying to, it's a, it's a very good question, first of all. And we have, we have seen this uh, also. And one of the things that we are trying to, how can you say, sell, what is a Swedish value proposition, is collaboration. Um, on all fields, both in terms of across academia, company, government, but also across companies and across industries and so on, right? Uh, and that is related also to sort of the value chain of innovation, where Sweden is in the absolute forefront. How do we commercialize our solutions to actually be able to sell them to make money? Because that's at the end of the day is the end yet for innovation, right? Uh, where we believe Sweden is is, is well advanced, uh, but we have not your 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 issue there, right? And Singapore, Singapore as such. Now we soon have a few friends from Singapore calling in, but they are still back to the sort of what we talked about in the 60s. We're very very strict that we follow the the protocol and so on. If if it's in the protocol, it's in the protocol. If it's not in the protocol, it's not in the protocol. Sort of right. Uh, I think. What would be the hope? Where, where should we look? Do we have any ideas on some areas where we, we could maybe um, inspire them to work differently? Yeah. What we do? Have an opinion about that? We will have, at the end of this year, uh, we will initiate together with uh, Marcus Wallenberg what we call Indo Pacific Business Forum, uh, the Business Summit. And I actually have a very easy slide for that. Um, so it's going to be in Singapore 5th to 6th of December this year. And the theme that we are looking in, into is, is green transition powered by innovation. Uh, we have a few sub teams on uh, connected to that. But the idea there is to meet them in this uh, triple helix forum and to have joint collaboration workshops with them. Um, and the idea here is not to do sort of a of a firework event where we do this event and then everyone go home and nothing happens. The idea here is to build a collaboration platform targeting to innovation between Singapore or Sweden for the coming the coming years. But to your question there, I think we can have a separate discussion on that afterwards because uh, yeah. Yeah, you will have some time after this event. We still have some copy and some food. So you can copy is excellent by the way. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, Ola has another question. Yes, I have a, a more basic question, perhaps. Yep. So, yep. Uh, we we organize the the uh, companies in in this region, in the yep. south of Sweden, in Skåne. So, if if you if you're a startup or a yep. small company and you want to enter the Singaporean market, 
what would you say? What would be the first step to do? What 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 do you do? Do you go to the business summit, or uh, what can you do to take those first steps as a small company? Yeah, uh, I think. I mean, it depends on 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 your business, but but in my book, uh, when you look at these figures we presented today, right? It looks impressive, and and this is the region you want to go to. But start to do your homework. Like, why why do I want to be here? Why 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 not focus on 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 the neighboring countries? So sort of do that that work because it's not easy to be there. Even if it's easy to do business in Singapore, it's 14 hours away in a plane, right? It's the other side of of, of uh, the globe. But start to doing your homework. But when you're zooming in on Singapore, I think it's important to start to figure out your go-to-market model. And in many cases, is that you find some sort of partner because setting up own shop and so on might be the ID. But in many cases, it's finding some sort of of of, of partnership. And then start to evaluate that partner and and be really sure in that. And we, Business Sweden, can help you with that. But it's of course other players on the markets that can do that. And you can do it by yourself and so on. And then you need to go there and meet these people because even if Singapore is a very advanced economy, it's still part of Asia where relation, personal relationships is very, very important and take it from there. So presence is important. Presence is important. Presence, is important. But then, of course, it depends a lot of which business you're in to, to be more precise in your answer. But these are the, the sort of the key steps to take. But be, do do your homework. That, I think, is is, is the absolute, absolute starting point uh, to it, to be realistic in your in your engagement and realize that it takes time. Thank you. Do we have more questions? No, I actually have one question. Yes. You read a lot that Singapore is like the door to Asia. Yeah. Um, but once we are in Singapore, you realize that it 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 it, it doesn't look that much as Asia. Mm. So is I imagine that it's a little bit easier to establish there than in other countries. Yeah. How does this process look like? To establish? Like once you are in Singapore to to expand your markets in other Asian markets. Yeah. So Singapore has a lot of family offices, wealthy people around, primarily in Asia, setting up their their their, their family offices in in Singapore. So a lot of the capital ownership throughout this region is in Asia, and it's of course good to be close to that to that capital, right? And also what we discussed before with all these headquarter companies. Part uh, the, the, the global company setting up their regional headquarters in Singapore. A lot of decisions are taken there, and you want to be close to these people, and then you take it from there, right? But then, depending on where where you want to go, of course, you take a different approach. Right? No, mm -hmm. very strategic location. Okay, if we don't have more questions, I want to thank you, Ricard. It has been thank a you. very interesting presentation for today. And now we are open the stage, opening the stage to the companies from Singapore that are now connected. Uh, it is a little bit late there, have six hours difference. Uh, so I will uh, start. We have already Xiao. If you are ready, maybe you can turn on your camera. Thank you so much. Um, and if you can share your presentation. Xiao is the co-founder of FOIO. Yes, we can see your presentation. Oh, hello. Uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, yes, perfect. You can start. You have three minutes. OK, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiao. So I happened to be in Stockholm in 2012, like studying computer science in KTH uh, in Stockholm. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, it's very nice to meet you. So welcome uh, so to my presentation to Fuyo, where we focus on simplifying the digitalization of tourism experiences for travelers and businesses. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. So in the post-COVID era, travelers become more like digital savvy and expect seamless digital engagement. However, many tourism destinations and businesses are not yet digitally equipped to meet these demands. So Fuyo empowers destinations and merchants to engage with visitors directly through our easy-to-use digital SaaS solutions 
bringing the gap between the businesses and tech-savvy travelers. Our key products, including Fuyo WeChat Mini Program Solutions uh, on WeChat ecosystem, and also Fuyo Smart Navigation System and our Fuyo's com Commerce uh, Solutions, designed to enhance the travelers' experiences and support businesses in the digital age. So Sentosa Singapore, one of the Southeast Asia's top attractions with 19 million annual visitors pre-COVID, has partnered with Fuyo to implement their mobile application SDK, their digital map, their WeChat mini program, their IoT and AR engagement solutions. So our business model is like service to business to consumer where uh, with three key pillars, uh, consulting solutions, customization, marketing and advertisements, as uh, one of the pillars and uh, SaaS solution licensing and subscription, as well as a revenue sharing on travel product sales. Yeah. The potential market for digitalizing top tourism destination is vast with uh, 76 of the global top 100 destinations in Asia and Europe. We estimate an addressable B2B market of uh, uh, 68.4 million for, for 30 top cities. While for the B2C market, focusing on Chinese outbound tourists alone, uh, we uh, find it's a huge market where they spend about 270 billion in the 2018 and frequent top, top uh, the, in, and there are a lot of uh, um, top destinations in Asia and Europe and where the travelers are going to. Yeah. Uh, starting in Singapore, we actually have presences in uh, China, uh, Japan, Korea, and uh, mostly in Southeast Asia, offering so so uh, software service solution digitalization tools to enhance visitors on site and uh, pre uh, trip planning experiences. Uh, our global team uh, consists of the offices in Singapore, HQ, uh, a development team in Chengdu, and also a, a business and operation team in Tokyo combining the best of the international talents to deliver the exceptional services. Uh, we are proud to have received recognitions for our innovation solutions, uh, get awards from Japan, Korea, Singapore, Germany, et cetera. Uh, we are actively seeking SaaS solution distribute partners uh, in Europe, uh, strategic partners in business and tech solutions, and also like FinTech partners to offer like bundled solutions. Uh, for uh, best to to different uh, merchants or the European merchants, yeah. Um, to to learn more and explore more opportunities, please don't hesitate to contact me uh, at this email address and phone number. Uh, this is our motto: stay lean and stay simple. And it's very nice sharing with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Xiao. Can can you leave your previous slide with your contact information for a while? Uh, oh, we will have oh, three yes, minutes. Yes. Yeah, uh, oh, so we sorry. have three minutes uh, for uh, the audience to ask you questions if you have any. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. Um. Yes. So sorry. I think. Yeah, Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. But do, do we have yeah. some questions here? Otherwise, I can, of course, um, if you contact me, I can send you the contact information of Shao. Yeah. I. Uh, it's working now. Yeah. <clears throat> One before. Perfect. So yeah. everybody has okay. access yes. to that. Um, yes, we have one question here. Ula. Yes, so so just a very basic question, Xiao, and, and good to see you again. Uh, good to see you again, Ula. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, so so can, can you describe, I mean, very briefly, what, what do you bring on, on top of the existing uh, uh, tourist uh, electronic services like uh, TripAdvisor and, and uh, all of those? Those, you know, those big players. What is what is what is really what what do you bring for the customer? Okay, so um, we see there's a actually a big uh, uh, the, this uh, in terms of the the travel industry or in terms of e-commerce industry, there's a trend to moving for one uh, towards from a market place into a, a private a traffic building a channel to omni channel. So actually for us, uh, we actually offer solutions uh, for, for the, the travel destinations to engage directly to the end travelers instead of 
going through a marketplace or a travel travel agency or an online travel agency. So that's uh, what we see that there's a, actually a happening trend that uh, in the past, the the, there's a very big gap between the travelers and the destination uh, who offer the services. But right now, actually with our solution, customers, uh, actually the, the destinations can talk directly to the uh, uh, travelers, uh, especially yeah. for for instance, the Chinese travelers, they actually use WeChat so much where indeed you can directly sell products to them through the WeChat ecosystem without uh, add, uh, adding on a third party layer uh, yeah, in between. So you can directly talk to your customers and sell your products to, to them, yeah. So Thank you so much. Thank you, Shao. Thank you. Um, I will call to the stage now to Dennis Ye. Uh, he is the CEO of Reality Detector. Uh, hopefully you can share your screen. Yes, hello, Dennis. And um, Shao, you can turn off your camera if it's okay for you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. Uh, can hey. you see my screen? The, the it's, gray screen? Wh it's white actually. If you can change your slide, I think it's the first one. Mm, are you changing your slide now? We cannot see your presentation. Dennis? No, otherwise, otherwise we can try with um, Ian until uh, Dennis fix his technical issues. So, sorry about that. Don't worry. Ian, yes, could you try to share your screen? So Dennis, I think you need to unshare your screen first. Can you unshare your screen, um, Dennis? Sorry, how do I unshare? Uh, you need to click on the arrow button, the one that points to the top. I think you have clicked that to share. Now you, you can either close your presentation or you can click that again. Uh, it should be an X button now. Carolina, is my presentation visible now? Perfect. Thank you. It is? Yeah. All right. Yes, we can see it. You can start. Okay, perfect. So a very good morning to the audience in Sweden. And um, by way of introduction, I'm Ian. I run Greeny Web. We are a digital decarbonization tool. So what we do is we reduce the CO2 emissions related with the internet. It's a pleasure to be here. And what I'm going to do today is a brief introduction of what you're seeing. And during the Q&A period, if no one has further questions, what I hope to do is a quick run through, a quick demonstration of our tool. We're seeking for collaborators in both the Nordics as well as the testbed in Sweden and um, perhaps other modes of collaboration in Singapore. So how is the digital carbon emission produced? So each time we use a digital product or service, we send an email for our, our computer, we use our handphones to send a message on WhatsApp or Telegram, or we use our tablets to collaborate with our coworkers. All of these data packets are sent to servers where one of three things happen, either storage, for example, your cloud solution providers, you store information in the cloud, processing, you can think of it like Bitcoin mining, the processing of complex algorithms, or last but not least, the retransmission of data to other, uh, to other parts of the world, to other devices. All of these processes in a server require energy, and that's where you have your digital carbon emission produced. So it's a huge problem today because the amount of digital carbon emissions we put out in the atmosphere is larger than every single airplane, airport, and airline combined. It's projected to grow by 300% within the next 20 years. And that's alongside an increase 
in an annualized gain of 9% per annum in energy consumption. So what our company does is we're tackling unsustainable digitization while allowing companies to achieve their net zero goals, to combat the volatility and the risks associated with high energy prices, as well as that of government regulation. So what we do in essence is a three-step process. We identify areas in a piece of digital infrastructure, for example, a web page, of where the carbon emissions, where the data, where the energy is consumed. We calculate that using a robust proprietary in-house algorithm. And last but not least, we rectify the entire digital infrastructure in an automated process, right? So this is done, um, and I'll show it to you perhaps during the three minute Q&A if no one has questions. So what we're looking for today is hopefully for a partner, I understand that IT companies present, for a Swedish test fit, a joint market development in Europe, as well as potentially in Southeast Asia, should there be adjacency and complementary skill sets. And last but not least, we're also happy for other modes of collaboration. So this is my LinkedIn, feel free to scan it, or alternatively, you can reach me at the email address stated. Thank you. Thank you. And Nia, you can leave that slide while you receive your questions, if there are some questions in the audience today. Give some minutes. Otherwise, uh, you're getting the contact information and I can also send you if you require. No questions? Yeah, Ula. I, I have one. Hi, Ian. Uh, Great presentation, uh, and, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity that, that your company presents. Uh, what, what's your view on the on the European market? Because we in, in, in the EU, we have a very uh, strong uh, trading system with uh, uh, with CO2, uh, CO2 shares. Is, is that uh, something that you view as a, as, a, as a great market opportunity for you? Will you focus on the European market? Uh, as a result of that regulation? Yes, I think that is a very good question. And what we're actually looking at would be the next five, 10 years, the mega trends. One of the things we see coming to us would be the eventual taxation, directly or indirectly, of digital carbon emissions as well. The focus thus far has been too heavily pigeonholed towards the physical environment, aviation, taxation, big oil, etc. Right. And now the amount of digital carbon emissions as a complete proportion of the total emissions with its growth and its increasing uh, prevalence with digitization of society, we see that there would be more regulation involved and that would spur companies to take action with regards to digital carbon emissions. So I guess the long answer would be we see large tailwinds in this particular segment. And we're very happy to work with potential collaborators to explore these opportunities present. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we welcome again to Dennis. Dennis, I'm going to help you sharing the presentation for you. Maybe it's easier. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulty. Uh, yeah. You can start. Yeah, so. What is that? Are um, you sharing can... your screen? Yeah, is it working? Yeah. We, okay. we see a prism. We see a prism and some colors. Yeah, great. So um, yeah, we, we are allowing you to see tunnel, um, infrared. Um, this is the James Webb telescope. It now allows people to see much more than they used to. So um, yeah, this is a Sierra. And uh, we have these sensors that can uh, enhance your sensors. And this is really important today um, because you know there's a mass movement of people in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are forced to. And uh, th there is no like trust mechanism, right? When people go to fight uh, in Ukraine or when they are fleeing Ukraine, um, people don't know how to trust each other. And uh, so our technology is trying to be the most precise possibility. Um, it's trying to solve the efficiency, effectiveness, and uh, intrusiveness problems of things like the polygraph, 
and our unique selling point is thermal features. Um, so we are in contact with the FEI polygraphers, the Singapore ones as well. Uh, we just saw our MVP to the, the Ministry of Defence in Singapore. Um, of course, to bring this to the Swedish market in any kind of way, it, it's going to need um, some collaborator, which we, we currently don't have uh, in Europe as well. And uh, yeah, so we, we ran lab studies. Uh, this is our proprietary face, neck, ear mesh. It's being used by the Air Force too. Um, yeah, so when people lie, their nose turns red <laughs> in a thermal camera. And they, even the head moves around a lot, like you just saw. Um, we, we can figure out which facial region is changing temperature. And uh, so investor, Tim Draper, uh, we've met some ministers, some Europeans. Uh, we, we run hundreds of trials. And, and these things are very significant. The eye and thermal features can supplement the polygraph machine, which hasn't seen innovation for 70 years, right? So it's probably a good time to change that. Um, this is just a quick video about technology, and then I'll just uh, take questions from you all. <laughs> yeah so uh thank you so much for your time uh there's much more that we can go through but if anybody is into this space plugged into polygraphers uh ministry of defense the police uh, uh please let, let me know uh yeah Yes, and again, you will get the contact information or you have it there already. So thank you so much. Do we have questions about this uh, very interesting technology in the audience? No? OK, thank you so much uh, for all of you. Uh, it was it has been very interesting uh, today's presentation. And with this, I close this event. Thank you so much.